have chosen a rather interesting subject which was probably more familiar a hundred years ago than it is today. But in those times, the approach was quite different. And we have certain knowledge and understanding which was not available to our ancestors. About the year 1380, there was born in a little town called Kempen, near Dusseldorf in Germany, one Thomas, who became known as Thomas of Kempen, or later Thomas a Kempis. Fortunately, we have some biographical information about Thomas. And we know that for his time, he enjoyed extraordinary longevity. He died in 1471 at the age of 91 years. And to make that in the 15th century was rather good especially without benefit of vitamins and other uh, helpful elements. One of the reasons, possibly, why Thomas a. Kempis lived so long was that he lived so quietly. Of his 91 years, he spent over 70 in a cloister. As a result, he is often described as one of the most unworldly of mortals. He had almost no contact with the ordinary, everyday life of working, struggling, striving persons. However, in his day, the German monastic system was still rather sketchy. And the little monastery of St. Agnes, of the order of St. Augustine, was one of the poor monasteries. It was up to the brethren of this group to find their own way in life and to find such means as they could to survive and preserve their institution. This they accomplished by gaining wide recognition as copyists of manuscripts. Uh, they copied all kinds of documents and papers for illiterate princes, rulers. Kempis himself actually made one complete uh, copy or transcription of the entire Bible. These brothers, therefore, by supplying books, psalmsters, antiphonals, and other necessary parts of the religious life of the times, managed to maintain their way of life. Of these copyists, Thomas Akempis was one of the best. He worked with the quiet, careful way of the detached religious person of his time. In many instances, he signed his copies as copyists. He certainly made no effort or had no intention of claiming any particular um, credit other than the fact that he made these copies. During this long life also, he wrote a number of books. Most of these books were as unworldly as his own career. Uh, the majority of his little tracts and productions were in the strange, cramped style of a copyist. He wrote brief uh, essays on the conduct of monks, on the regulation of a monastery, and on such subjects as keeping its gardens in order and the buildings in repair. He was advanced to prior at one time, but found this too much of a strain and responsibility, so he resigned and continued in a comparatively insignificant office 
throughout his life. He is described by his contemporaries as a very youthful expression and appearance, even in advanced years. Mild-eyed, smooth-skinned, and with the complexion of a small child, even when he was very close to 90. We do not know too many details about him. He was a fair scholar, and for his time had to be uh, competitively literate in order to take care of the copies of the work, uh, the works that came to the monastery. He also began the accumulation of a small library within the monastic structure. He did nothing of an outstanding or extraordinary nature as far as his conduct was concerned. Sometime about 18, about uh, 1430 or 40, a little work came into circulation called The Imitation of Christ. This little book, of very obscure origin, has the distinction of having been translated into more languages and have passed through more editions than any other book in the world with the exception of the Bible. Now, the comparatively small number of persons who know this work today would make it seem impossible that such could have been the case. But second only to the Bible, the imitation of Christ has been the bestseller of all time. The earliest copies of the work carried no author's name. They were published or issued anonymously and were so copied. And out of this peculiar conflict of circumstances has arisen a literary controversy, a controversy that is far older and has been fought far more enthusiastically or bitterly than the controversy over the authorship of the Shakespearean plays. Ever since the 15th century, efforts have been made to discover who wrote the imitation of Christ. Early evidence seems to point very strongly toward Thomas Akempis. And in the course of time, for the average person and the public in general, the controversy died out. But even as late as the present century, it has been stirred again by scholars who have been unable to reconcile this peculiar and extraordinary work with the life of its presumed author. In the course of trying to solve the work, many early manuscripts were consulted, and uh, the authorship problem was not only complicated but confused to chaos by the result. At the present time, there are 15th century or early 16th century manuscripts or early printed editions of the imitation of Christ with over 14 different authors given on the title pages. The runner-up, we may say, or the second choice to Thomas Akempis himself, was a man by the name of John Gerson. Now, John Gerson has been a wonderful subject for study. He has been examined in every way possible and he has never even been discovered. No one has ever been able to find him. If there is a controversy over the authorship of the book, there is a still greater mystery around the principal claimant other than Akepis himself. It is now suspected that this man, Gerson, was invented, that he never existed at all but that his name was composed out of abbreviations and notes upon some of the early manuscripts. We do know, however, that even now the authorship of this work is not conclusively uh, assigned to Thomas Akempis. Therefore, he is the popular candidate at the moment. He seems to retain most of the favor and enthusiasm 
relating to the book. But efforts to examine and classify early copies and early manuscripts are extremely confusing. And into this confusion has been added certain other factors. Various early religious groups had a great desire to claim this work for themselves. In order to do so, they tried to manufacture authors from their own particular orders, particularly the Benedictines and the Franciscans. So within the cloister itself, quite a tempest arose. It is generally cleared for our thinking now, but the fact remains that the book is totally different from anything known to have been done by Thomas Akempis. And there is much possibility that he was not the true author. If he was not, it is also possible that the work arose among the remnants of the old Gnostic and heretical sects in Europe, and may even have been spurred into existence by those metaphysical or mystical secret societies who are known to have been just beneath the surface of medieval culture. If we wonder this question, we can also uh, point out some parallels uh, in passing. The famous Shakespearean parallel we do not hardly need to mention. But there is a grave question as to whether Moore wrote his utopia because it is totally different from the man himself. He was a highly progressive uh, socialistic type of publication coming from one of the most reactionary men of his time. A man whose personal cruelty is almost beyond description. And yet here is a great idealistic book. Another example is the Robinson Crusoe of Defoe. He is supposed to have written the story in three days. There is grave doubt. So with all these works, there can be uh, other possible authors. And nearly all of these controversial books are key books in some part of man's struggle for ethical culture and survival. It is therefore quite possible that they were produced by unknown persons for purposes now obvious, but at the same time in their own day it seemed useful for them to remain concealed. Although the term or the title of the book, The Imitation of Christ, is really an excellent title considering the treatment, it is one of the most misleading titles that perhaps could have been given as far as the public mind of today is concerned. We always think of imitation as copying. And when we find a book with such a title, we may be inclined to assume that the author attempted to write a fifth gospel or attempted to imitate the style and writing of scripture. This is not the intent at all and has no part in the procedure. The idea of a facsimile or a reproduction or an imitation could and has gravitated against uh, the general acceptance of the work in some sources. Therefore, it is essential for us to create a certain background and then to examine the book as to its own content. Also, we must bear in mind that back in the 14th at early 15th century, there was a tremendous upheaval within the religious life of Christianity. This upheaval was to affect the entire future of the church, and through the church and the later Protestant Reformation, it was to affect all peoples who hold nominal Christian affiliations or who are brought up in a nominal Christian atmosphere. So much of Western civilization is keyed to this uh, that we cannot fail to realize 
that it has affected and influenced practically every development we have had and every uh, step in the unfoldment of Western history. During the time of Thomas Akempis, the term imitation of Christ meant only one thing, the personal imitation of the life of Christ that each individual was to seek his salvation by imitating the conduct of the master. This is the word, the use and meaning of imitation in this particular usage. There were two very important schools that were struggling for domination in European thinking. One of these schools had to do with a voluntary submission uh, to the historical Jesus as set forth in the Gospels and the imitation of his historical conduct as the basis of spiritual security. If, therefore, uh, we analyze this, we see, for example, the reason why medieval and early, even earlier groups of Christendom chose the life of, of solitude, of chastity, of renunciation, of impoverishment, as being the proper way to imitate the teachings and example of the Master. This imitation was to these people the key to a spiritual virtue. They moved upon the hypothesis that in order to understand any subject or matter, we must gain a likeness with it. If we are to understand persons, we must know their experiences through experiencing these things ourselves. This attitude still holds among your penitenti communities of New Mexico, where the literal imitation of the life of the Messiah constitutes their annual passion play. It was this belief that only through likeness could we come to an inner understanding of the meaning of the ministry. Thus the various orders of renunciation and repentance. Thus the various restrictions which have ever been placed upon the Christian life. Restrictions regarding pleasures, luxuries, and things of that nature, which were regarded as ungodly. The second school that was also uh, coming into prominence did not outwardly reject the idea of imitation, but changed the concept of it. And it was this change of concept that we begin to find in writings such as those of Thomas of, uh, Thomas of Kempen or Thomas of Kempis. There gradually arose among the medieval Christian mystics the conviction which had already found rooting in the Near East, namely that the true purpose of the faith was to cause the individual to discover a divine mystery within his own nature, that it was not through eye service or physical obedience utterly and completely to a literal historical record, but through a searching within the self for an inspiration arising within the self and associating this interior inspiration with the Christian mystery. Here then the old division that began in the separate viewpoints of Peter and Paul is restated. We have the difference, for instance, between what has been termed religious and political ecclesiasticism. The Augustinian group 
following the work of their founder and his great book, The City of God, actually affirmed the political significance of Christianity. They affirmed that it was the duty of the Christian religion to gradually become the sole proprietor of the conduct of men and to create a spiritual commonwealth on earth. That one by one, all peoples and all nations would come under the rule of Christ. And that in this rulership would be built a utopian civilization. A civilization ruled over uh, by a hierarchy or group representing the Christian faith on earth. This concept went in one direction and went strongly in that way, binding the church into a powerful institution demanding temporal recognition. The other group, equally sincere in its dedications, did not believe this, but held that the kingdom of God is not of this world. They held, therefore, that the journey to salvation is and must always be an individual seeking after reality. That it could not be done politically, but it had to be the result of the individual making his spiritual life important in himself and moving gradually from involvement in material concerns to total absorption in the mystery of spiritual life. This broke the church wide open during the 14th and 15th centuries and ended what has been called the universal church. For from the time of this great break between these two viewpoints, there has never been a healing of the wound. And religion in the Western world has always been divided on these two principles. And this division still affects us in our daily thinking where we are still concerned with religion in politics, religion in education, as distinguished between religion as private belief and private conduct. This occurs and reoccurs even in our day, indicating that for 500 years this peculiar division has existed within the structure of our religion. Now with this background, we can begin to approach the ideas and ideals of a Kempis. And we search with him through the very beautiful but austere and severe concepts, no longer thinking of them simply in his terms, because his experience was very different from ours. It is recorded in the old monastery where he lived that he was a man of visions, of strange, mysterious pressures within his own consciousness. Such pressures would not be unreasonable in the case of a person so isolated from the common everyday problems of living. We may depart from the world, but we cannot be sure that all of the world departs from us. And there is usually some measure of conflict in the heart and life of the recluse and the hermit. Even so, we perceive in him some of the values uh, that are important in the modern psychological study of mysticism. And regardless as to whether or not he was the author, the work itself is laden with these values and will require a certain amount of thought toward the end of what can this mean to us and how may it have an effect upon our own daily search for truth. I think we must all agree with a Kempis or with the imitation of Christ on the fundamental premise of the work, namely that man is placed here in order that he may enlarge his inner life his graces and his understanding. This seems to be a fairly uh, reasonable statement. It is supportable by everything that we know 
For we realize that man is endowed with faculties and propensities beyond those necessary for his physical survival. If man had been intended merely to reproduce his kind and to perpetuate a species of animal upon the earth, then the various faculties, intuitions, inspirations, ideals which he possesses would not have been necessary. In fact, they would have been a further burden upon him. For to burden a being with useless or meaningless attributes is merely to complicate its existence. We are therefore moved to affirm with the mystic theologians of the Middle Ages that man has been given certain abilities, certain instruments of procedure, certain memory, uh, intuition, inspirational factors, visionary extensions of perception, by means of which he stands unique among creations, namely that he alone apparently can dream of a better state for himself and his kind. If this be true, and there is every evidence that it is in every generation exemplified by the nobility of the great idealists that have ornamented the, whole, the story of mankind, then the cultivation of these graces, these values, and these powers should certainly be regarded as the legitimate purpose of man. Or if we wish to be more conservative, we can say a legitimate purpose for man. Some may not feel or assume that they wish to undertake so arduous a program, but that they are capable of such a program and have the basic instruments necessary for it. These cannot be denied. Consequently, motivation becomes a very important factor. And the development of man as a spiritual being or as a being of ideals and principles is entrusted or has been entrusted for a long time to religion and religious philosophies. There is a very slight differentiation in many instances between theology and philosophy. Particularly this was true in the pre-Christian world where these elements mingled uh, almost completely. More recently, however, religion has gained ascendancy in certain aspects. Religion being the basis of an enthusiasm or a motivation to make use of these potentials not commonly employed. So Thomas seeks to find out what it is that causes some men to gain a great conviction and others to be deficient in conviction? Why do some persons dedicate their lives to purposes beyond personal profit, gain, or even survival, whereas others are not called to any such dedication, but continue to drift along in the familiar courses of uh, we'll say, lukewarmness as to all dynamics. They just do not take part in any special emphasis upon value in any of its forms or kinds. The seeming answer to this is that those who have found a way of life, who have been impelled into a dedication, when, in, when asked about it, are not able to explain the circumstance themselves. And this has been a very important element. Most people can tell you why they do not believe. Very few people can tell you why they do. They can give you words, but these words, when stripped of non-essentials, are reduced uh, to a mere phrase or sentence. The individual 
follows certain impulses within his own nature. He becomes a certain kind of person because he feels like becoming that kind of person. And his feelings are ripened by his experience. But his experience in turn is meaningless unless this experience finds a sympathy within himself. We experience every day interesting and important occurrences, situations. We make discoveries, become informed in matters. And yet, unless these experiences fit into the over-pattern of our general conviction, we ignore them or discard them or misapply them. Thus, experience can help us to intensify a mood or a decision or a determination. But experience is not usually the basis of this mood or determination. This mood or determination arises in the inner capacity of man and indicates clearly those values and faculties by which he is superior to other creations that we can commonly contact in life. Having thus come to the conclusion that man's spiritual aspiration is essentially the result of an inward movement rather than of an exterior movement, we can say that the man of character is the man moved from within, and the man without character is the man who is moved by everything else except the within. Also, we can say that a person moved from within is moved by a unified force, whereas the person who is moved from the outside is, is and must be in a state of continual adjustment with conflicting and even con contradictory movements, pressures, and incentives. Thomas Akempis holds, therefore, that Man's desire to grow, to be more than he is, arises not primarily from his intellect, but more directly from his emotions, and also that it is an internal decision to which some arrive at birth, others attain later in years. But the moment of this decision cannot be predicted. It may arise from what appear to be outside circumstances, but if it does, these circumstances cause this chemistry or alchemy by their relation to interior values. Thus ten persons placed in the same circumstances will not come to the same conclusions or assume the same responsibilities because inwardly they are different persons reacting differently to stimuli. On the grounds that the early Christian mystics, that there was a spiritual core or life center in man, they regarded this as the proper explanation for the higher incentives of the individual that these incentives arose from pure value within himself. And this pure value was the pressure or motion of the divine power in him. By this divine power he actually exists, for without it he could not be a living creature. But he is not fulfilled merely by the fact that universal energy sustains his material existence. He is fulfilled only uh, when this body, life, or person is ensouled and becomes truly a living being, living in the sense of directive, of self-moving, of a being with determination, and this determination essentially dedicated. If this, then, is the idea of the ensouled man, 
we can come to a definition that is a little different from psychology, but not so different in its principle. Namely, that to be ensouled, an individual has to acknowledge the allegiance of good within himself. That it is his own inner value of good, taking possession of his total life, that constitutes ensouling. And souling, therefore, is dedication. It is not the presence in us by arbitrary circumstances of a power of good. It is our own decision to permit this power of good to be the leader in our life. And until this decision is made, the soul exists but does not ensoul the body. A person, therefore, who is outwardly dedicated is a person whose outward nature is ensouled by his inner life. This ensouling is in the form of a mystical sacrament. It is a sacrament which is in itself difficult to explain, for the hour no man knoweth. This ensouling is also a kind of second coming. It is the return of the divine power into management over our lives and affairs. Thus we can begin to see how the two interpretations of religion divide even in their relation to man. The political power of religion is exemplified in the political power of soul over body within the person himself. Uh, the city of God of Augustine is therefore also the composite personality of the individual and sold by God, dedicated to God, and devoted to the works of the divine power. This is one school of thought, and it led toward the life of dedicated service in the world. The individual, so ensouled, so convinced that the spirit moved his body, then made use of the aptitudes, attributes, abilities, powers, and propensities which he possessed in order to advance the authority of the soul in the world around him. Out of such uh, dedications have come art and music and literature. Also, to a measure, philosophy and more recently science. For whether we assume uh, the conscious process or not, to be the instrument of the soul means to release through ourselves those forces and powers which we regard as commonly beneficial or inclined to advance the common good of all society. Under these conditions, ensoulment creates the busy man. It creates the dedicated doctor. It, de de it creates the researcher, the person who in all walks of life has sacrificed personal comfort, personal uh, relaxation and pleasure in order to serve a principle greater than his own personal desires. And nearly everyone who has ever achieved anything in this world has in some way been so dedicated. For it is necessary for us to find a work larger than ourselves in order to find an enthusiasm capable of sustaining the endeavor. Very few persons have ever found happiness or satisfaction merely in the aggrandizement of themselves. They think they are going to, but they do not. Here again, as one authority points out, as early as the 15th century, a strong Buddhistic influence was present in Italy and Germany, and this is something that most folks do not know. This influence had already moved in from the Near East 
and was to have further emphasis upon European life as the result of the return of the Crusaders. The Near East had been nourished by the Far East. Your dervishes, Sufis, and Muslim mystics included in their studies and their curricula much of Vedanta, Yoga, and Buddhism. These forces came back into Europe again. And while they were considered and still are within the body of the church heretical, they also did exercise a modifying influence upon small groups of mystics. And some of these mystics, although they remained nominally within their faiths, became exponents of essentially Eastern philosophies and religions. Just as Emerson was essentially a Brahmin, although he was a Unitarian minister. In this regard, the second problem began to develop, namely whether this motion outward into the life of service exhausted the spiritual potential of man. The question that bothered the theologian then, and to a measure still bothers millions of people, is whether the destiny of man is to be achieved by the creation of the perfect commonwealth. If we were able, as a result of several thousand years of the most dedicated religious effort, to create a comparatively harmonious and happy world, assuming this miracle to be possible, and finally did bind people together into a kind of security in which their physical needs were taken care of, in which all of the various necessary uh, elements of life were either socialized or communized to the degree that we had no longer any poverty, that we overcame artificial class distinctions, that each individual was honest in his weights and measures. Well, we can go on with this, but it r rapidly approaches fantasy, so we'll pause at this time. <laughs> Assuming these things to be possible, do they constitute the end for which man was fashioned? Is he supposed to live like the continuance into futurity of the familiar fairy tale? Is he to be happy forever and ever? Actually, life itself seems to point against this. It points against it in the numerous problems which exists wherever socialized life is experienced. It seems to point to the same thing in the fact that man himself, by the very limitation of his own lifespan, cannot think in terms of forever and ever. Also, there is something essentially not quite satisfying in this process of forever building for an unknown futurity. Because if this futurity arises in a different kind of world, its problems must be different, and problems differ with every generation. By the time we have solved the problems of one generation, that generation itself is gone. This means that in the early religious thinking, the great question came up again and again. Is the life dedicated to the exterior advancement of society the life of the true Christian? Even though he does all these things well, does this doing constitute the fulfillment of purpose? If not, in what way does this fulfillment lie? In what direction? For this answer, we have the monastic conviction that the solution to man lies in the gradual departure of man from the concept and existence which we call worldliness. In the Middle Ages, 
there was much more inducement, perhaps, for man to turn his back upon the world than there is now. The world was rather miserable. Individuals had painful and desperate existences. The advantages and luxuries that we know were non-existent. But we are beginning also to become a little doubtful about the values that we have served so long. For we now stand in the presence of a future way of life in which our official researches and atomics can threaten to devastate our whole world as a result of the ill-laid plans of madmen. Out of this, all of the works of good men perish together, and we are beginning to wonder again whether the dedication of the individual to the continual pressing forward of his social existence is really the answer which he seeks whether it can ever lead him uh, to the goal he dreams of. The average person departs from this life with a full realization of his own frustration, and he also departs from it upon the eve of momentous circumstances which are to affect those who come after him. The struggle also to change the world in a proper way has always appeared to be a losing battle. For each one who makes a supreme offering of good, there are hundreds of tyrants who will undermine and destroy the good works of man. To continue forever in this direction seemed oppressive even in the 14th and 15th centuries. Therefore, recourse to theology which was a little crude, but picturesque, to say the least, helped to clear some of this situation. The old scripture readers began in their studies to interpret the early works of Genesis and other sections of the Bible to imply that man is only in this world because he has fallen, that his fall represents a loss of direct contact with spiritual value. The fall is the obscuration of the divine life within man. It is locked within a bodily world. And the theologian said that when man fell from the Garden of Eden or from a spiritual state and fell into a mortal state, he fell into the empire of Satan, or as Augustine calls it, the city of Babylon. Consequently, that this mortal life of man is actually in a sphere of activity in which spiritual values can never be completely revealed, and that the reward of the good life is to depart from here. In a time when departure was much simpler than living, this had great validity. Today we are inclined to consider it a disaster, because we find ourselves with more things to live for and greater interests and activities. But it might not be bad for us to pause for a moment to try to evaluate this concept and see whether or not uh, we are completely extroverting a pattern and are therefore coming into some of our troubles because we have not cultivated enough interior life. The interior life, or man moving from the world toward himself, was always symbolized by your monastic retreat. It represented man searching for value, departing from that in which values seemed to be deficient, and approaching that in which values seemed to be greater. Lao Thomas, like most of the peoples of his time in religion, had no clear insight as to how the mere retiring from the world would produce spiritual value. He lived in a time when monastic orders were not all spiritual by a long way, where a great deal of corruption existed within monastic orders. 
that the mere departure of the individual from his society does not guarantee him a spiritual value. On a broader term, as we find by reading carefully the content of the imitation of Christ, this is applicable to our own personal lives. The individual who turns from materiality to religion may only bring materiality to religion. It does not mean that he necessarily changes. He may accept all kinds of codes and creeds upon his conduct. He may even accept certain rigid disciplines of behavior, limiting or restricting himself in the name of his religion, and still the spirit of the faith may completely elude him. So it was not the mere retiring into a non-materialistic uh, environment. A Kempis recognized the tremendous need for something to happen in this process of transference from one way of life to another by means of which the individual could be repolarized as to his total concept of life. And here we find him drifting a little into your Near Eastern and Far Eastern mysticism. He came to the conclusion that retirement from the world was not a matter of habitat, not a matter of the holy house you entered, but was a gradual detachment of the individual from those bonds and limitations with which he has been tied to a totally materialistic psychological conduct. The whole matter is therefore raised from physical conduct to psychological impulse, from what we do to the motives by which we do these things, and from the action itself to the quality of the energy behind the action. Aquinas and many others of the early church philosophers came to this conclusion also, in fact and substance, that for the laity, and of course uh, today the laity constitutes the greater body of mankind, for the laity the first and essential task is a reorientation based upon the concept not of complete renunciation or detachment, but of the establishment of two levels of values, by means of which we may follow the admonition of Jesus, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. This was the beginning of humanistic mysticism in Europe. The problem of the person not making a violent separation between himself and life, but following the Near Eastern concept of gradually enriching an inner life, a process taking place so naturally and in such an orderly manner that no shock or stress could be immediately noticeable or even ultimately felt the enriching gradually by purposed effort gradually results also in man developing those faculties of perception within himself by which he is able to reinterpret his own experiences, bringing them into conformity with a higher level of integrity and belief. To do this, it was the opinion of these peoples back in those days that our first and most important task was to become firmly convinced that man is capable of a conscious, purposeful, interior existence, that he has an inner life that can be as rich, varied, interesting, significant, important as his outer life that this inner life is not something that should be cultivated only on his deathbed, but that it is something that he should be aware of throughout all of his years. 
that there are certain essential joys, pleasures, privileges, real and thrilling en enjoyment and pleasure in the enriching of the interior part of the nature and the adorning of it with interior equivalents to the luxuries with which we deluge the material body and our material lives. We cater to the body and to our bodily sensitivities throughout the years. What we want, we must have. We live in a quality of continuous competition with other people. We are posited and polarized firmly in an objective sense, and our subjective life consists almost entirely of interludes of worry, regret, fear, depression, and general melancholy. We say that an individual, now I've heard it stated by persons who should have known better, that the individual who lives on the outward world is happy, the one who lives inside is miserable. This causes us to place a curious connotation on inhibition or frustration. For a person who lives on the inner side of his own life is now held to be a sickly escapist who is running away from the unhappiness or dissatisfaction or incompleteness of his material life. A Kempis would have said that the individual should run away from the completeness of his exterior life. The thought being that we run away from that which, with which we are surfeited. And what we call our present way of life, if indulged in long enough and enthusiastically enough, always ends in surfeit. The individual exhausts the power of pleasure. The, the spoiled child who has too much in its younger years loses all power to enjoy in later years simply because it is surfeited. The individual who has more than he needs, instead of being increased in pleasure and joy, is increased only in dissatisfaction, responsibility, and burden. Therefore, he is not achieving the ends which he fundamentally regards to be desirable. He is not happy, he is not intelligent, he is not good. All so-called exterior extroversions and escapes are not solutional in their entirety because we will always have to escape as long as there is anything to escape from. And ultimately, we will be worn out by running away from the challenge of ourselves. To meet a balance in this, the individual should begin to sense <coughs> values above those completely and obviously physical. He can affirm this by membership in any one of 500 religious groups. But the affirmation in itself means nothing, because these groups are all burdened with individuals who have affirmed and done nothing. It therefore has to follow that this experience is individual, that we can be inspired a little by each other, and we can be impelled to follow experience of persons whom we regard as authoritative or as having demonstrated the success of their conviction. But regardless of by what authority or by what circumstance, we recognize the possibility of the inner life. The attainment of it must be an individual action. To the Christian mystic, the search for the Christ experience was the search for the inner life. We find this in Bemi, we find it in Gictel, and we find it in Claude St. Martin, Baron von Eckethausen, 
and many other mystics. Always this search is for the christening power, the principle of the divine being in man. In our day, where we have so much more of physical distraction and attraction than was ever known in earlier times, the hypnosis of our mortal concerns centers very strongly upon us. But as most of the mystics have pointed out, even as late as Havelock Ellis in his Dance of Life, the search for the inner self is timeless. We think of the fact that we must spend so many years learning to play the piano, or learning medicine, or perfecting ourselves in some art or craft. But actually, the motion toward the inner life is measured by its own intense integrities rather than by time. The mystical experience which seems to unfold an eternity within the individual may occur in a matter of seconds. Therefore, we are not in a position to actually demonstrate that we have no time to cultivate an inner life. This cultivation has nothing to do with our physical time allotments and should not be associated intimately with the fact that we have to sit down somewhere and spend hours in contemplation every day. This is not the principle as the earlier mystics saw it. They saw two possible courses for the person seeking first the kingdom of heaven. The first was to transform their material conduct into a series of sacraments, to do exactly what they have always done, to peg their shoes and cut their cloth as they always did, to do the common everyday duties of life, to enjoy themselves, to work and to play and to rest as they have always done, but to attempt to reorient the motivations, try to give these things that we do a certain value gradually transforming our entire conduct into a sort of mystical prayer of labor. That we no longer do these things thoughtlessly. We no longer do them for utterly selfish purposes. We seek to refine the motives and principles causing us to act as we do. The individual must work, but his work has new meaning if those he works for occupy a new relation to himself. If instead of drudgery it becomes privilege, it is the same work taken with a different attitude. So the mystics recommended strongly the individual striving to understand through the things he does and find new attitudes, new reasons for old familiar activities. And by finding these new reasons and these new motives, to discover that in so doing, that he reduces the labor, that the moment he moves into any work from a superior motive, the amount of energy required for the work is reduced. This is very, very important. The individual who grumbles at his work from morning to night and accepts his responsibilities as heavy burdens upon his life and soul, preventing him from doing everything that he wants to do, this individual uses ten times the energy in the doing of his work as the person would use, who accepting this work as necessary, does it gladsomely because it is of service and value to others and helps him to maintain a true relationship with society. If his motives are constructive, his energy is not exhausted nearly so rapidly. Also, as motives become more valuable, 
in any line of activity, a further discrimination comes in, and the person begins to realize that certain things which he is doing are meaningless, that they have no place in a mature pattern of living, that he performs these things only because he always has, or because he thinks he should, or because it is the easiest way. When under thoughtfulness, the performance itself is no longer significant. And as his thoughtfulness arises from within himself and is not imposed upon him by the dictatorial demands of others, he is not resentful as he would be if the advice was imposed upon him. In the beginning of the mystical concept of living, we have therefore this quiet revitalizing or ensouling of the life around us, the ensouling of our jobs, our attitudes, our pleasures, our interests, the gradual ensouling of the commonplace. The discovery, therefore, of the God in the sky, the clouds, and the whirlwinds. The discovery of the disciplines of life and the simple habits and practices which we follow. And the further experience by which the irritations, aggravations, antagonisms, criticisms, and condemnations by which we burden ourselves are gradually eliminated simply because they no longer fit into our pattern. If then we follow this idea, we see the gradual return of man's center of integration to his own soul level, the level of his conscious being in which he labors with understanding for ends he understands. And in understanding them, he has removed from them all their bitterness and all of their uh, grief. And he finds them now as satisfactory and as reasonable and proper parts of conduct. If he continues in this way, he will gradually create a form of what the religious people have called the holy life, or as Plotinus called it, the way of wisdom. For the way of wisdom is nothing but the good way. It is the way of the individual doing things well for their own sake, and not constantly under the pressure of ignorance and confusion in his own psychic life. The second course of procedure, apart from this, is the retiral of the individual gradually from the mortal concerns of things. The ancients did not really advise this generally. They did not believe that we should become a world of hermits, that we should change the earth into a vast monastery or convent. Such was not the idea at all. The idea was that if the person could once establish an interior cloister, an inner sanctuary, that from this he could be moved into the doing of things essential. By his own nature he might retire further and further into this, not because anyone demanded it, but because his own reflectiveness seemed to need it, seemed to consider it important that he should pass further and further from an intensely competitive way of life to one of greater internal serenity. This is a major change, of course, in the affairs of men, and cannot be easily or quickly attained. But the mystics were of the opinion that man could cultivate an inner life without leaving the outer world, but that gradually, through the years, the outer world would leave him, and he would find greater satisfaction in the fulfillment of inner purposes and inner attitudes. That he would live no longer under the pressures of the frustration of his worldly ambitions, but would have other ambitions even more important. Assuming, of course, the possibility that individuals or groups should move in this way, 
under a properly regulated society which does not relieve them of the need for earning their own bread but does relieve them from the need to feel that the challenge of wealth must be met at the cost of survival we may have a more moderate type of world and uh, I think the, our friend Thomas a Kempis was really of the opinion that the moderate world was the nearest to the good world for man a world in which first things were first and second things were second there was no question of depriving either of its rightful place but there was to be no confusion in these relationships if man gradually cultivates a stronger and stronger internal his understanding becomes his corrector his character becomes the Virgil to lead him through the mysteries of this underworld also the mind liberated from false values and no longer merely a bookkeeper to man's acquisitiveness has opportunities to attain certain ends of its own the mind becomes the natural instrument of appreciation recognition and discrimination it leads the individual in quiet ways and refresheth his soul but while it is the instrument only of his ambition it torments him day and night forcing him to judgments and decisions that are not valid in the development of this pattern man's gradual internalization bringing with it continual moderation leads him ultimately uh, to that degree of insight in which a reversal takes place within his constitution and the management of his life is moved from a personal mental level to an impersonal soul level there comes a time when the man of soul takes over and becomes the commander and takes the place of the man of earth who has been the leader of the person's existence today we are normally led from the outside we are moved directed guided instructed from the outside we are pressed to every achievement by the outside and we have given to the faculties and powers by which we are associated with exteriors the full power to decide our lives these faculties are not bad they are simply inadequate no human being can live well if he does not allow the best part of himself to govern the rest the best part of man is not his ego with his ambitions and his opinions and his prejudices the best part of the human being is that which reposes in quietude within him and which to the religious person is the soul which is the abode in man of the divine principle if the best leads the rest we have then not a change and neglect of all responsibilities but a new relationship between the inner life and responsibilities to the early Christian mystic this transference of authority from the exterior objective personality to the interior subjective personality was the mystical union it was the individual finally dedicating his personality to the service of his principles it was the outer life accepting the authority of the inner life and as a result of this acceptance humbling itself to the inner life acknowledging that this inner life is its sovereign is its leader and shepherd and that its greater good comes from obedience to the interior 
rather than constant rebellion against exterior situations. From these it does not follow that this change causes the person to be impractical or what we would term unworldly. He does not disappear in a mist of abstractions. He simply gives the weight of his power to that part of himself which he regards as the best and the highest and moves all his conduct from the most mature level of his own existence. He does this through becoming aware that it can be done, and then through the gentle processes of attempting to enrich the levels of his action. Some things are pertaining particularly to the body, and other things are, are exactly symbolical of the soul. To be, therefore, ensouled, the outer self or the personality must imitate the way of the soul. This is the mystical imitation. How do we objectively imitate the power of the soul? Plato says that the peculiar keynote of the soul is beauty, and that as man exteriorly is sensible uh, to the material things of life, and if we may say that efficiency is the keynote of the body, so we may also say that beauty is the keynote of the soul. The imitation of beauty is the outer life gradually changing its rules and patterns with emphasis upon the beautiful. Beauty on its various levels is differently interpreted, whether it be as order, virtue, or peace, or harmony. All these things are phases or aspects of beauty. The to cultivate beauty with a proper appreciation is therefore to cultivate the psychic side of life. We are all to a degree sensitive to beauty. We know how we are attempting to make even the simplest utensils of our living more beautiful, colorful, better designed. We are now making pitchers and teapots and stoves more gracious in appearance than ever before, simply because we find people like them. Therefore, beauty is likable, and the individual who has no sense of beauty must cultivate this because he cannot, without this sense of beauty, be successful in other things. The natural sense of beauty being at least latently present, it can be cultivated by observation and reflection. The individual can enjoy the better things of art and music. And coming through the terrible pressure of our modern civilization is the greatest revival of music the world has had in a thousand years. And it's not all bad music. We are becoming more and more aware of music in the home. It is a pity that we have lost so much of the impulse and instinct to perform this music. But we are still grateful for it and are better and better equipped to bring into our homes the great compositions and the great composers. These trends indicate soul hunger for beauty. This expresses itself in soul hunger for love, for peace, for grace, for friendship, for true regard, and all these things that we sacrifice to the crassness of our mental efficiency. We must come to decision finally, and out of this decision restore the beauty of reason behind everything we do that is practical. For without true beauty, the greatest degree of practicality cannot be attained. The moment of the refinement of these processes, leading in the end to man's sudden experience that he is a living soul, that this living soul is in communion with a continually flowing source of divine inspiration. 
that as the light of the outer world shines upon his body, so the light of God shines upon his soul, that he has an inward life and an inward light, and that this inward light is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And it is the experience of the presence of this light, gained and earned by life according to principle and according to beauty. It is this experience of the inner effulgency of the presence of God, of the inner immediate mystery of man in the presence of an eternal and imminent divine that to the ancient mystic was the final culmination of his search for reality. He was then fully convinced that by being like good, by being so like, is actually the discipline of imitating the good by intent, by placing the self under the discipline of becoming like soul. And in so doing, transforming the soul which was made body back again into the soul which was made soul. In this transference, which has to occur within the life of each person, we attain soul status by performing the works of the soul, by copying as nearly as we can the noblest of the instincts of man. We ennoble our own instincts, become accustomed to good things, and in the end regain moral and spiritual orientation. This is the true meaning of the imitation of Christ as it is given in this little book. It is the individual becoming soul-like through the practice of the virtues of soul life. And through this becoming similar or imitating, he instinctively grows and becomes capable of being ensouled because he has created in his consciousness a friendship for truth, a love for truth, and an instinctive habit of acting according to truth. When he achieves these ends, he attains unity with truth, and that which he has served so lovingly bursts through his objectivity and becomes the ruler of his inner life. This simple pattern is obscured by many words, but undoubtedly it was the dream of the writer of this book, and perhaps gives us a little new insight into the condition of religion in the 14th and 15th centuries of this era. Time's up. Now we have a several little announcements here. We have quite a problem for next week. Suppose we sometimes do, sometime do land on Mars and find there that a group is just on its way to leave Mars and come here in order to convert us to the true faith. Well, that might be a what the English used to call a sticky wicket. <laughs> that might be a problem. If we ever find another inhabited planet, will we go there as a teacher or as a student? If we go as a teacher, we'll feel very good about the whole matter. But if we suddenly find we have to go as a student, it's going to be the biggest embarrassment in the last ten million years. <laughs> and prior to that time, embarrassments probably didn't count. Consequently, it is the great moment in history. If we find in space someone more intelligent than we are, it is over, going to overthrow the egoism of ages. And in this moment, there better be a basket to catch the scraps, because a world is going to go more neurotic than it ever was before. There is nothing more devastating than a collapsed superiority complex. <laughs> well, what are we going to find out there? More seriously, uh, if we are moving into a universe in which there may be millions of orders of intelligent life,
What is this going to do to religion? Is it going to do anything? Or is it merely going to give us greater understanding than we ever had before of values we have always held? On our own one little planet, how closely have we intuited the cosmic faith? I think it's making an interesting subject, so we hope you'll come bring all your friends and those people who maybe are not your friends now, but you can have a nice discussion with them afterwards. This is a wonderful subject for post-mortems. I'd like to also call attention to uh, some of our publications. We have our 12 lecture booklets now bound together in one volume, which we think you will be interested in. And one of our colored plates, uh, large colored pictures that has been out of print for some time, our symbolic cross, is now available in full colors again with uh, the division of the spectrum into its 12 parts indicated on the cross in a rather subtle way, but of some interest, I think, to all persons interested in color, color therapy and color philosophy, so that it has a little double meaning in addition to what we feel is a very gracious picture. We're also going to lecture in April in Portland and Seattle. Therefore, uh, if you have friends in, that, in those areas, will you uh, please let them know or give us their names and addresses so that we can send them programs. You will find a notice of these lectures on our bulletin board at the front door. We also have a few programs for these northern lectures available which we can let you have if you wish to say uh, to mail them yourself but please do not mail them by trying to use the permit that is not permissible except in mass mailing our book of healing we think will be of interest self unfoldment is a very good book to think about this morning and our book the mystical christ these together will help you to integrate the concept that we tried to present and we think you will find it worthwhile to give it some serious thought. And thank you very much.